December 0, Part 5 I awakened to the alarm clock set on my phone. The time read 5 a.m., which was usually when Shane was up doing his morning devotion. He characteristically is an early morning person. Due to the busy schedule planned for today, I wanted to join him rather than have my devotion later on. However, Shane was still in bed. Granted, we slept late last night, but that never stopped Shane from waking up before daybreak, as he has gotten so used to doing. It was practically ingrained in his subconscious to be an early riser. Switching on my bedside lamp light, I peer over at Shane. The bed sheets were ruffled, and the comforter covered him up to his waist. He was facing me, with his head laying on one hand, and his other arm extended on his pillow. Sometimes when I watch him sleep at home, he would flicker smiles as he dreamt. Yet, as I looked at him now, his facial expression seemed cold and lifeless. I slip out of my bed and approach Shane. Upon closer inspection, his cheeks appeared to have lost their warmth and he looked rather dusky, as if blood was sucked out of his veins. I lean forward to arouse him from sleep with a kiss, but no sooner did I touch his face with my hand that I immediately withdrew it. <gasps> I gasp in horror. His skin temperature was chilled. My heart begins to beat faster. What is happening? I start to panic and shake violently, shouting for him to wake up. He was unresponsive. No, it can't be. I scream, no, 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 no. He can't be dead, I thought frantically. I quickly used the room telephone to call the hotel reception, and the lady answered, good morning. How can I help? I interrupted. I need an ambulance now. Room 308, please hurry. Tasukete. Karewe shinduriu. Help me. He's dying. My vision increasingly blurs as tears well up and pour down my cheeks in streams. I did not want to believe Shane was dead. I held him in my arms in hopes of heating up his frigid body with my body warmth. Lord, please don't let him die. Please, Lord, please. I cry out in sobs. There was a loud knock on the door, and I ran to open it. The ambulance paramedics from Tokyo Midtown Medical Center rushed in and expertly strapped Shane into a stretcher. I grabbed Shane's backpack and stuffed extra clothing for Shane and I inside because we were still both wearing the hotel's complimentary night robes. I followed closely behind the ambulance crew as they whisked Shane into the back of the emergency vehicle. The double door shut and we zipped to the emergency room, blaring the siren to part the sea of cars in the way. The paramedics gave Shane oxygen and also performed cardiopulmonary resuscitation, CPR, serially. They spoke among themselves in Japanese, and I could catch their somber words as they performed emergency procedures. We arrived at the medical center, and the paramedics briefed the doctor on duty concerning the status of the patient. I overheard. He was already dead when we saw him. My heart was stuck in my throat, and my mouth went dry. The paramedics excused themselves, and the consulting cardiologist began to execute a thorough clinical physical examination on Shane, after which he pulled me aside to talk to me. I saw it all written on his face as he tried to break the bad news to me. Madame, I'm so sorry. Your fiancé is dead. There is nothing else we can do to revive him, he said. Wailing, I instantly collapsed to the floor as my knees crumpled. I didn't care that people were watching me. I felt like I was the only one there alone. My heart stung like a thousand needles pierced it. I beat my chest in anguish. Why? 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 I yelled as I continued to yawn. The doctor patiently waited for me to grieve thoroughly. I walked to Shane's bedside and stared at him. His eyes did not contain the sparkle I knew. The light truly had left his body. Reaching forward, I gently closed his eyelids with my fingers. Then I whisper in his left ear, Please, please come back to me. I pause to see if a miracle would occur, where he'd get up, embrace me, and laugh at what a great prank he pulled off. But there was only a deadening silence from him. I exhale deeply as reality sunk in further. Fine. Stay where you are. 
I will get you back one way or another, I continued to whisper. You promised to not leave without telling me where you were going. I started to choke with tears as I spoke those words. It's not fair, I thought angrily. The doctor cleared his throat <clears throat> and asked if Shane's body could be sent to the mortuary now, while burial preparations could, would be determined forthright. I nodded, my head in consent. I watched as morticians covered Shane's entire body with a white cloth and rolled him away. He now was considered a biohazard to other patients. The doctor asked for me to follow him to his consulting room. So I gathered my belongings. He excuses me for a few minutes so I can change from the night robe into a t-shirt and jeans. I exit from the consultant's restroom and sat down in a comfortable chair across from him at his large desk. Again, I express my condolences for your heavy loss this morning. I want to formally introduce myself. My name is Dr. Joji Sanu, a cardiology consultant here at this medical center, and I need to ask you pertinent questions about your fiancé. Please try to provide accurate information as we discuss and diagnose the medical condition your deceased had. I would need your consent for an autopsy to be done to be sure of the postmortem diagnosis. Do you agree to it? I hesitated for a few minutes to remember what Shane and I discussed in one of our random conversations, envisioning that we would grow old together and pass on to the afterlife with each other. We decided that our children should not bury, but cremate our bodies and have a small funeral. It was less expensive and we did not want to put extra burden on our kids. We wanted to be remembered by the life we lived as well as the fond memories with family and friends, not how we were buried. I replied to Dr. Sano, giving permission for the autopsy and for the body to be cremated soon after. He asked if I was sure, and I gave him affirmation. He handed me some paperwork that required my signature. Then he began his investigation. After asking me a series of questions, it was clarified that Shane did not suffer from an overt medical from any overt medical problems, just the occasional common cold. Certainly, no cardiac issues. He was overall very healthy and fit, never took any illicit drugs, nor was he on any medications. The doctor inquired about Shane's family history. I could confidently speak on his lovely mother's health. She was a hardy elderly woman with a young soul, who still was very agile. However, all I could say of his father was his death as a young man when Shane was six years old. You mentioned his father was Japanese too, the doctor asked. I nodded. Hmm, I see, he mumbled in Japanese, to which I interjected. What do you see, doctor? Dr. Sano raised his eyebrows in surprise at my fluency in the Japanese language, then was embarrassed that I must have understood all the conversations I had around me. He sighs and begins to explain. I believe your fiancé died of sudden arrhythmia death syndrome, SADS, which is simply defined as the sudden death of an apparently fit and healthy young person with no cardiac structural abnormalities after ruling out the cause of death, after ruling out the cause of death is not drug-induced. It appears that he may have had specifically Brugada syndrome, which is a genetic condition involved at involving abnormal electrical activity within the heart, which leads to increased risk of sudden cardiac death. You mentioned that he never had episodes of passing out while at rest, which can occur with the syndrome. However, this condition is common with people of Asian descent, and his father is the missing link. He too may have suffered from the syndrome and passed away early because of it. I kept silent listening carefully as Dr. Sano continued. The autopsy would confirm hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, where heart muscles are oddly thickened without any obvious cause. I will be sure to no notify you of the results. I thanked him for discussing the deduction leading to his diagnosis. At least I was able to have closure pertaining to the cause of death. I navigated my way back to the hotel via Uber and finally entered our room. Sadly, I thought, now it's only my room. 
I couldn't stand being in the same room where this dreadful incident happened. So I requested for a change to a single room far away from 308, room 308. And I was given room 208 instead. Unfortunately, it wasn't a preferred distance away, but that was the only room available. I packed all our things into the new room and sat on the, ble- the bed. My f- mind flashed back to Shane's ghost white face before the coroner's white cloth covered his entire body. God, why is this happening? What did I do wrong? I perused my list of sins I committed recently that I could think of and asked God to forgive me. Was it because I moved in with Shane as the wedding date approached? Is it because we stayed in the same hotel room while still unmarried? Okay, God, I'm so sorry for cohabiting, even when you convicted us not to. Please forgive me and bring Shane back to life. I didn't hear the Holy Spirit speak, but he brought to my mind the paper crane. I despised that object so much and was annoyed that it was brought to my remembrance. Nevertheless, I rummaged through our belongings as I couldn't remember where I dumped it during the room transfer. The origami winged creature surfaced in a deformed state, having been trampled by a few items. I held the paper bird in the palm of my hands and wondered, Lord, what do you want me to do with this at such a mournful period in my life? To be continued.